In the previous lecture, we looked at the king of the north in chapter 11, and we particularly discussed the first verses up to about verse 39, and to now we are going to continue with the subject. We had a look at the meristic structure of the chapter, where you have the forces in a Hegelian conflict with one another moving towards a synthesis. And in that context, we will continue with verse 40. And this particular period has dealings with the time of the end. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. So the king of the south will push against the king of the north. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over and he shall enter into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown but these shall escape out of his hand even Edom, Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now this conflict between two mindsets at the end of time will eventually be won by the king of the north. But at the time of the end, and we have a time prophecy in the book of Daniel that deals with this time prophecy, and it starts at the close of the 1,260 days, which means it starts in 1798, which was the time when papal supremacy came to an end in a political arena. So at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, so the one mindset will overcome the other mindset, but we must remember that we discussed that both parties really fall under the same leader because they both wish to destroy God's covenant and his people. And that they sit at the same table and discuss issues. And then the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, chariots, horsemen, many ships. He will enter the glorious land, but some will escape. And it's interesting that those that escape, Edom, Moab, and the chief children of Ammon are all descendants of Abraham. The Edomites come from Esau. The Moabites, they come from the descendants of Lot. And Ammon also are descendants of Abraham from the other marriage. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape, that is the south. And he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. So he will take control of the economic aspects of the secular world. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his step. Now, the Ethiopians were the southernmost border of Egypt, of that empire, the southernmost border. So in other words, he will take all of what belongs to the king of the south under his control and they will be at his step, at his heel. In other words, they will follow his lead. There will be a synthesis, a capitulation, and they will do his bidding at the end, when final synthesis is achieved. And then comes an interesting interlude. Verse 44 says, Tidings out of the east and out of the north. Remember, he is the king of the north. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. And we will be dealing with this more in a later lecture. 
And therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant his, the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now, this sentence, he shall come to his end and none shall help him, parallels what we saw in the prophecies of Daniel and what we see with the prophecies pertaining to the man of sin. He will be destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's coming. It is a divine intervention. The stone strikes the statue at the feet and it is not by human hands. So finally, the king of the north comes to his end and is destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's coming. So the east and the north that he is concerned about must pertain to the coming of Christ who comes from the east and the true throne of the north that is coming for retribution. So that is a message that goes to the world to warn people against this power. Now, if we look at this last verse over here, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. The glorious holy mountain is God's realm. The mountain, kingdom, this refers to God's people, God's nation, if you like. And that word in is fascinating. Now, if I look at the NIV, it says, he will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one shall help him. Or if I look at the New King James Version, it says, and he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Now, does a little word like in and at and and make a difference? Yes, it does. It makes a huge difference. Sadly, I am inclined to believe that the King James Version in this case is correct. And that is scary. Because this means he will plant his mindset even in the holy mountain in God's church. Whereas this implies that he doesn't get that far. Well, we will see in the course of the lectures whether this is so. So let's go to history and confirm some of these points. Daniel 11 verse 40, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Now, the time of the end being 1798, the end of the 1260-day prophecy, history tells us that Berthier, the French general, entered Rome and took the Pope captive and by decree of Napoleon declared that the Papal States had been dissolved and that a secular government was put in its place. So secularism overran or pushed him out of his position. And then secularism must rule for a while and then the reverse will take place and the king of the north will overrun the south and eventually the synthesis will take place and the south will be at his heels and they will vent their fury on the holy covenant collectively. But we also saw that both parties are really controlled by the dragon power and therefore both parties were actually also consulting each other and much must have been happening behind closed doors as they discuss how to bring people to decide against the Holy Covenant. In 1798, Bertia made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one, Encyclopedia Americana. So secularism, humanism, all of those isms which exclude 
God out of their political arenas take over. Now I'm fascinated by history. The one who actually did this was Napoleon. And just by a little quirk of, shall we say, divine intervention, he actually was also the literal king of the south because he had conquered Egypt. He had entered into Egypt. And I'm fascinated to see that Freemasonry has something interesting to say about this and so that we make sure we use the right sources, we use them. Freemasonry's web pages itself, the Grand Lodge of the British Columbia and Yukon, and they claim over here the evidence in favor of a Masonic initiation previous to Napoleon's assumption of the imperial title is overwhelming. The initiation took place in the body of an army Philadelphia Lodge of the Ecosias, primitive rite of Narbonne, the third initiation of Ecole Communique, being an advancement in the rate these initiations took place between 1795 and 1798. This is fascinating stuff. So in the years prior to this push, secret societies were being formed and gathered into their ranks those that would play the major parts in the final events. Because the battle is for your mind. And what they can achieve in secret can have an impact on the whole of humanity. So what happened once these secret societies had been formed and who formed them? We will have to look into that. And we will see, and even in all the previous lectures that we have done on these topics, we have seen that Organizations such as the Jesuits and others were deeply involved in the formation of secret societies and actually controlled them behind the scenes. So in actual fact, these kings, the king of the north and the king of the south, were sitting at the table behind the scenes. Now, Napoleon and Freemasonry, they say it was never, there's no absolute proof, but they claim that obviously he was. And what did he do? Always by their fruits you must judge them. August 15, 1769, this comes from the Freemasonry webpage as well. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte in Corsica, trained in the military schools in Paris, was promoted to general after the siege of Toulon. He led the troops into most of Europe. And in 1798, Egypt. Isn't that beautiful? Returning to France, he was nominated first consul after the revolution of the 18th Brumaire. Napoleon founded the Bank of France. Now, I want you to take note of what is happening here. We're getting an entirely new political system in the world. One that moves the emphasis from the religious sphere to the secular sphere. And in the culminating years afterwards, secularism seems to rule and seems to have pushed the religious out of the way. And behind the scenes, things are happening. New structures are set in place. New organizations, new forms of government. And eventually, the tables are reversed. And the king of the north overruns these mindsets because they have induced in the minds of men a longing for something higher. Very fascinating possibility. He founded the Bank of France, reformed the tax system, restored the church. No more dominance of one group of churches over another. Improved the education system and in 1804 assumed the hereditary title of Emperor 
of the French. The following year, he was at war with Russia, Austria, and England. In April 1814, he was forced to abdicate and exiled to Alba. He attempted to regain his empire in 1815, was defeated at Waterloo, and banished to St. Helena, and died six years later. Now, here are some of his fruits. Napoleon appointed his brothers to Masonic office. This is their web page, not conjecture. This is not a conspiracy. This is fact. Louis was named deputy grand master in 1805. Jerome was grand master of the Grand Orient, Westphalia, eldest, the eldest. Joseph was made a Freemason at the Tuileries in April 1805 and appointed grand master of the Grand Orient of France. And Lucien was a member of the Grand Orient of France. And these were the ruling people of Europe. Now, if we go to the history books and we look at the International Napoleonic Society, we find something else that's very interesting. Napoleon and the Jews. Napoleon was the first leader in Europe to grant liberty, equality, and fraternity. And those same watchwords became the watchwords for another nation that would receive a gift from France namely the Statue of Liberty, and would introduce those same systems of thinking and governance into its midst. And he gave this to all religions. And this lithograph here represents Napoleon granting liberty to the Jews. Napoleon's uncle, Cardinal Fesch, also got involved. He told Napoleon, Sire, so you wish to e the end of the world to come with your laws to give the Jews equality like the Catholics? Do you not know that the Holy Scriptures predict that the end of the world will happen when the Jews will be recognized as a corporate nation? Fascinating stuff. You see, up until that time, Protestantism had filled the world with the mindset that the papacy was the Antichrist. And now suddenly the Antichrist as a political entity disappears from the world scene and his power, his political power, is removed from their sight. Where is he now? Isn't he going to bring about the final events? He dives underground. He doesn't disappear as a church. He remains a woman. But secret societies spring up everywhere. And these secret societies are founded by the very people that now have disappeared. And then they forbid people like Roman Catholics from joining some of the societies like Freemasonry. And then when the objectives have been achieved, they unban the societies as happened under John Paul II. This is interesting stuff, but here's a new world view coming along. A new world view. You see, the Jesuits had taught that the Antichrist was yet future and that he would arise and that he would intimidate the Jews, the church not being there anymore but having been raptured. And all eyes, therefore, should await the coming of a Jewish kingdom so that the promised Antichrist could come. Now the one who actually started this philosophy is Napoleon. At the time of the end, this philosophy, the secularization of the world, will push the king of the north out of the way, and then behind the scenes things can happen, while to the minds of the people they see something totally different. For religion, Napoleon ended the schism and restored the Catholic Church to France by the Concordat of 1801. So the Catholics couldn't have been that powerful. They were removed from power. Where's the Antichrist? He ensured freedom of religion and equality to the Protestant sects, and he declared France the homeland of the Jews. After it became obvious he could not establish their national home in Palestine, the code Napoleon established, equality before the law, emphasized the sanctity of the 
family and assured the legal gains of the revolution. The Code of Civil Procedures ensured widespread use of mediation in the courts and laws, and the courts were secularized. We move from religious dominance to secular dominance. Napoleon's religious opinions were the height of modern philosophy. This is what the Napoleonic Society writes. He was completely given to tolerance. Everywhere that Napoleon went, he led tolerance by the hand. Everywhere that he found several religions, he ended the domination by which one took precedence over the other. This sounds marvelous. Faith, Napoleon would say, is beyond the reach of the law. It is the most personal possession of man and no one has the right to demand an account for it. Doesn't that sound marvelous? And people had been sick and tired of religious fervor, religious intervention, religious suppression, religious laws, and here comes freedom. Now what if eventually you can lead this freedom into chaos so that people can ask for the pendulum to swing the other way? And now most people don't actually know about this. They continue to say, now here's an amazing incident which is not generally known. When the French troops were in Palestine and besieging the city of Acre, Napoleon had already prepared a proclamation making Palestine an independent Jewish state. It didn't exist. They were going to establish it. He was unable to realize this project because of the intervention of the British. This proclamation was printed and dated the 20th of April, 1799, but his unsuccessful attempt to capture Acre prevented it from being issued. The Jews had to wait more than 150 years before their state was proclaimed. The proclamation, however, did bear fruit. It was a precursor to Zionism, heightening awareness of the cause of the Jewish statehood. The ideas Napoleon expressed found the admiration of many who saw Napoleon's gestures as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy, which foretells of the restoration of the Jews to their land. The idea drew many adherents, especially in England. Here is a seed a new philosophy being planted in the minds of men. There will be a Jewish state. The preparation for such a state must have been phenomenal. Just imagine. The Jewish people scattered throughout the entire world. Nothing but chaos here in the Middle East. And now a state is to be proclaimed. How are you going to achieve it that all the Jews that are ensconced in the various societies and normally quite affluent and good at what they are doing, how are you going to get them to budge and move there so that this can be fulfilled? That must take some effort. Not only that, if this happens, and eventually a temple can be built there, and a new philosophy, which is a Jesuit philosophy, of the Antichrist who will come, Alcazar, Ribera, futuristic, Jesuit philosophies, well, then you have a new Antichrist as well, and the world can look at political events unfolding, and the question of where you stand with God doesn't come close to you. It's something that happens on the world arena and doesn't affect you. Here's a totally new theology. And it comes when? What is the date? 1798. A new philosophy. Now, I just want to ask you, what does the world believe today? Do they believe what the reformers believed regarding the Antichrist? that it was the papacy and that it would set itself up as a god in God's church, change times and laws and make null and void the precepts of God. That's what they believed. 
Or is it going to be someone who will come in the future and attack a new state that had to be created? Well, this is what the world believes today. So this has been very successful. 118 years later, the British would issue the Balfour Declaration, which called for a Jewish homeland. And ultimately, 31 years later, in 1948, Israel would be recognized as a sovereign state by popular vote in the United Nations General Assembly. Perhaps it can be said that Napoleon's premature announcement on that first day of Passover in 1799 played an important role in the creation of the State of Israel. On the 16th of August, 1800, Napoleon declared, if I governed the nation of Jews, I should reestablish the Temple of Solomon. This is fascinating. Revelation chapter 11. Now, I'm not going to deal with Revelation chapter 11 because we've did, done it already in a previous series in the Total Onslaught series, where we spoke about secret societies and how they arose out of the turmoils of the French upheavals and finally the French Revolution. We're not going to repeat that. But let's look at some of these verses. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. God's temple must be measured, and God's temple consists of people, individuals. It's not a temple of stone, as we shall see. So who belongs to God's people? There must be a standard. There must be a measure to which they measure up. And what will be the standard which will determine whether they measure up? It must be involved in the righteousness of Christ, and as such it must be in involved with his law, the measure of judgment. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot 42 months. There's the 42 months, the 1260 day, the three and a half year prophecy pertaining to papal supremacy from four fifth, from. 538 to 1798, as it was expounded in the Protestant world. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, the olive trees, and this is the word of God we read in parallel text. They shall prophesy a 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. God's word would be suppressed during the time period of papal supremacy. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks, the light of the world, standing before the God of earth. So during that period, there would be the suppression of God's word. And then eventually they would be done away with for a time. We'll come to that. Now, Napoleon and Islamic masonry. This is very interesting. Freemasonry appeared in Egypt soon after Napoleon's conquest in 1798, when General Kleber, a French mason and top commander in Napoleon's armies, established the Lodge of Isis. So secret societies are now being formed in these secularized nations that adopt the new philosophy. Nowhere more so than even in the United States of America. Washington was a mason. All the great buildings that point to the seat of government lie on Masonic stones. This is history. This is not conjecture. French masonry dominated Egypt until British lodges began to appear after the British occupation in 1882. So there are secret societies formed within these countries in Islamic masonry. Freemasonry was very popular in the first half of the 20th century, and many important Egyptians were masons, along with British rulers and aristocrats who occupied the country. In fact, the Egyptian monarchs from Khedive, Ismail to King Faud, were made honorary grand masters of the, at the start of their reigns. 
So the Islamic world is actually ruled in this history by Masonic individuals. From 1940 to 1957, there were close to 70 Masonic lodges chartered throughout Egypt. At one time, the leaders of the Nationalist and the Waft parties were Freemasons, and many members of the Egyptian parliament were Masons as well, where they mingled with the military commanders and the aristocrats of the ruling British occupation. So it was really ruling behind the scenes. Verse 7, Revelation 11, and when they have finished their testimony, this is the biblical word, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So secularism will be instrumental in trying to make null and void God's word. And all the isms arise in this time period evolutionism, spiritism, they all arise then. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Spiritually, not literally, spiritually. So this is a mindset, a secular mindset. I ask you a question, do we see it today in the world? What do we see? Do we see Systems of government which are God-based or do we see humanistic systems of government? When we look at our school systems, do we see God-centered education or do we see evolutionism? Secularism is ruling the world. But secularism is leading to the collapse of morality. And once it gets to that point, then the king of the north philosophy will have the power to overrun it and grab the minds and hearts of the people while they are being duped and deceived into looking outside of themselves for the fulfillment of prophecies. This is a very sneaky plan. Gratan Guinness Comments on the man of sin. Now, who was he? He was a Church of England man. And he lived here in the early 1800s. And uh, he wrote this, or the late 1800s, he wrote here this famous work, Romanism and the, Roma and the Reformation, 1887. And this is what he writes about the summary of Protestant evaluation of the prophecies. He, referring to the papacy, sits in the temple of God. Observe the place occupied by the man of sin, the temple or house of God. And then he says, this is Protestantism. This is not and cannot be any Jewish temple. Paul, who uses this expression in his prophetic portrait of Romanism, employs it both in Corinthians and Ephesians with reference to the Christian church. In the second epistle to the Corinthians, writing to Gentile Christians, he says, ye are the temple of the living God. In Ephesians, he calls the church a holy temple, a habitation of God through the Spirit. To Paul, emphatically, the temple of God was the church of Christ. This is the temple in which his prophetic eye saw the man of sin seated. It is no person in a temple of stone, but a power in the Christian church. But the new philosophy says, it is a man who will sit in a temple of stone. But in order to get people to believe that, you will have to create a nation and not only will you have to create the, recreate the Jewish nation, Christ said to you it is desolate, but you will have to restore the temple so that people can say, well, when are we going to be raptured? When is this going to happen? When in actual fact, it's sneaking up on them individually. Now, here are the temples. This is the first temple, what it looked like. And that's the model of the second temple that it looked like. And are they preparing for the third temple? Yes, they certainly are. 
Here is the menorah ready for the third temple. 2 Corinthians 6.16, let's make sure of this. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. We have moved from a literal to a spiritual temple and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the corners, chief cornerstone, in whom all our building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. The scripture is clear. There's no question here of a restoration of a physical earthly temple God is talking about an earthly temple that has a spiritual connotation. It is a human thing with each individual being grafted in. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. This is not a literal temple that the Bible is speaking about. And how is it that the whole world is waiting for a literal temple? 1 Peter 2 verse 5, Ye also are lively stones, living stones, are built up a what kind of house? A spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. What a brilliant move to take away the emphasis on a relationship with God and obedience to Him as the test of discipleship and to place it into the realms of the physical that you can watch on your television and the news programs to see how prophecy is unfolding. We have moved away from Protestantism and we have accepted Jesuitism. Romans 2 verse 28, for he is not a Jew, he is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. We've moved from the type to the anti-type. The rituals pointed to a greater reality. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seeds and heirs according to the promise. So the physical lineage that people aspire to cannot save you. Say not ye are Abraham's seed. It will not save you, says John the Baptist. And the anti-typical John the Baptist at the end of time will say exactly the same thing. Galatians 6.15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. The Israel of God is a spiritual entity and no longer a physical entity. Now if we look at dispensationalist teaching, let's have a look what they teach. Christians have an interest in Jerusalem and Israel. This is dispensationalism. This is what the world believes today. This is what the evangelical world preaches. This is what the Pentecostal world embraces. This is the power machine of modern prophetic Christian interpretation. It is as far removed from Protestantism as the East is from the West. It is a capitulation to Jesuitism. Perhaps one of the most significant signs they look for is the reconstruction of the Holy Temple on Mount Moriah, the third temple, and the reinstituting of Old Testament sacrifices. If I reinstitute the sacrifices, what am I saying? 
Am I not saying that Christ's sacrifice is null and void, that it didn't fulfill the type? Isn't he the Passover lamb? Amen. This would be followed prophetically by the appearance of the man of sin, the Antichrist, in the temple to shut it all down. And they all believe this today. This is not what the Bible taught. This is not what Protestantism taught. To call an end to prayers and sacrifices. This is called the abomination that makes desolate or the abomination of desolation, Daniel 9, 27. This is what they believe. This is a totally new theology. And in order to get people to believe this, you have to be prepared to dislocate millions of people and herd them to Palestine to create a nation that can, can fulfill the prophecy. But in order to do it, you must control all the powers that are role players in the game. Does that make sense? And that's where the secret societies come in, that were all set up during this time. Well, is this a reality? Are they really doing it? Yes, they are. You can look at the web pages. It's fascinating. The third temple, Gershon Salom, Salomon, chairman of the temple, Mount Faithful, Mount Faithful, the preeminent organization in Israel working for the rebuilding of the third temple, opined on the record saying that an, a Netanyahu government, do we have one now? We happen to have one would be good news for the prospect of the rebuilding of the temple. In previous political campaigns, Netanyahu incorporated into the platform of his Likud party that if he was elected prime minister, he would press for the opening of the Temple Mount for Jewish worship. And they claim that the Temple Mount faithful have the cornerstone ready to lay. In addition, the Temple Institute now has all the furniture and priestly garments ready for the third temple. The priesthood and the Sanhedrin have been revived. We're ready. And the world cannot wait for this event. And once this happens, whoo, Christians will be raptured. There's no such thing in the Bible. This is a new theology. This is a Roman Catholic conceived theology and we'll be dealing with it in great detail in future lectures to show that it's not biblical and yet the whole world believes it. Well, I was on the Temple Mount the other day, not so long ago, and there, of course, stands the Dome of the Rock. And today... There is great conjecture. As I walked there, we were speaking a wonderful language called Afrikaans. And these three gentlemen were so excited, they greeted us in that language. They came from South Africa. They were such nice people. They were so friendly. Look at them laughing. We sat down, we had a good chat to them and a good laugh. I have sympathy for the Muslim world. I have great sympathy for the Muslim world. And we'll be dealing with some of those issues and some of the things we will be talking about are quite sensitive. And uh, at the moment, they pointed me there to these trees on the Temple Mount that were dying. The tops were dying. And they said to me, these tops are dying because the Jews are excavating excavating under the Temple Mount and many of the water sources of these trees have been cut off. In fact, they fear that the very foundations of the Dome of the Rock are in jeopardy. Imagine if that building just one day disappears into a <laughs> some cavern underneath. What chaos will we have? But they claim they want to build the temple. Now, I want to discuss a little bit of sensitive history. And if I go to sensitive history, well, then I must quote sources that say it rather than that I say it. This is a fascinating book, and the web pages are there. You can check it out. Facts are facts. This is a book that was written by a Jewish man. And he confronted the thinking of many of the high-placed individuals 
of the world. This is interesting stuff. In this book, Benjamin H. Friedman, a Jewish man, writes about the Jews and reveals an interesting history. He states that the present Jews in Palestine are not the true descendants of the Judeans, but rather descendants of the Khazars. In the letter addressed to D. David Goldstein of Boston, Massachusetts, a convert to Catholicism, the author, Benjamin Friedman of New York City, dated October 1954, provides some fascinating insights. This is in the public domain. Let's study this for a while and see where we get. Benjamin H. Freeman claims that the word Jew was only introduced into the English language in the 18th century and that Jesus referred to himself as a Judean and not as a Jew. Inscribed upon the cross when Jesus was crucified were the Latin words Iesus Nazarenus Rex Iodeorum, which means Jesus of Nazareth, ruler of the Judeans. Now this is fascinating. I went and checked it, and it is so. <laughs> yes, it happens to be so. Now the word Jew today has a religious as well as a political connotation. You think of a Jewish entity, a government, but you also think of their religion incorporated at the same time, whereas the term Judean is a geographic connotation. It's a geographic, it doesn't incorporate the religion. It's where he came from. He was from Judah. He was a Judean. He further writes, the form of religious worship known as Phariseeism in Judea in the time of Jesus was a religious practice based exclusively upon the Talmud. The Talmud in the time of Jesus was the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, all rolled into one of those who practiced Phariseeism. The Talmud today occupies the same relative position with respect to those who profess Judaism. So the rituals and rites that many of them observed were based on the Talmud and not on the Torah. Rabbi Morris, this is all from the source, Rabbi Morris in Kurtzer wrote a most revealing and comprehensive article with the title, What is a Jew? which was published as a feature article in Look magazine in June 17, 1952 issue. In that article, Rabbi Morris Kurtzer evaluated the significance of the Talmud to Judaism today. In that illuminating treatise and that important subject, by the most qualified authority at the time, Rabbi Morris N. Kurtzer stated, the Talmud consists of 63 books of legal, ethical, and historical writings of the ancient rabbis. It was edited five centuries after the birth of Jesus. It is a compendium of law and lore. It is the legal code which forms the basis of the Jewish religious law, and it is, note, the textbook used in the training of rabbis. So rabbis are trained according to the Talmud. And the Talmud has very little in common with the Bible. And then he states, From the birth of Jesus until this day, there have never been recorded more vicious and vile, libelous blasphemies of Jesus or Christians and the Christian faith by anyone, anywhere, or any time than you will find between the covers of the infamous 63 books, which are the legal code which forms the basis of the Jewish religious law as well as the textbook used in the training of rabbis. I don't want to go into it. If I were to put the quotes on the screen which the Talmud contains about Jesus, you would be horrified. It is some of the vilest statements that I have ever had the dishonor of reading. And this 
is what their training consists of. He then proceeds to quote some of the most horrendous statements from the Talmud regarding ethical issues, and not only regarding ethical issues, which deal with many, many issues from economics to relations with women, etc., and, of course, the view on Christ. As to the origin of the present Jews in Palestine, he states that those Jews derived from Eastern Europe and many, many of the Jews that today live in the reconstituted state of Israel come from Eastern Europe are not descendants of the Judeans or the lost tribes of Israel, but rather descendants of the Khazars. Who were they? They were a nation most people do not even know of. He writes, the so-called self-styled Jews in Eastern Europe in modern history cannot legitimately point to a single ancient ancestor who ever set even a foot on the soil of Palestine in the era of Bible history. Research also revealed that the so-called or self-styled Jews in Eastern Europe were never Semites, are not Semites now, nor can they ever be regarded as Semites at any future time by any stretch of the imagination. What secret mysterious power has been able for countless generations to keep the origin and the history of the Khazars and the Khazar kingdom out of the history textbooks? Did you ever learn about it at school? I never learned about it. And out of classroom courses in history throughout the world, the origin and the history of Khazars and the Khazar kingdom are certainly incontestable historical facts. You have to do some cross-checking. Even the Jewish encyclopedia is quite explicit about it. This was the Khazar kingdom. Here is the Black Sea, the Byzantine Empire. Here was Persia. And here was the kingdom of the Khazars. It was a massive kingdom. Now let's look at some of this interesting history. The Khazars were an Asiatic nation. And the Jewish encyclopedia states Persian origin that converted to Talmudic Judaism. Now, obviously, some of the rabbis involved there could have been Judeans and probably were Judean descendants, but their converts are not Judeans. And that had conquered a vast area of Eastern Europe, which was in turn later conquered by the Russians in the 10th and 13th century. So that is why there are so many Russian Jews. Have you ever thought where they came from? Did they escape from Palestine? Were they the lost 10 tribes? Did they emigrate to Russia? No. This is a totally different nation that accepted Talmudic Judaism. 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 He writes, After a historic session with representatives of the three monotheistic religions, King Bulan, 7th century, 7th century, decided against Christian and Islam, because Islam had just arisen, just arisen, and selected as the future state religion the religious worship then known as Talmudism, and not known and practiced as Judaism, which was totally different, which was based on the Bible. They adopted the Hebrew alphabet and the Khazars adapted words to their requirements from the German, the Slavonic, and the Baltic languages. This language was known as Yiddish. And Yiddish used the Hebrew alphabetic characters, but not Hebrew. It's not Hebrew. It's Yiddish. I've always wondered, when I hear them speaking Yiddish, I understand quite a few words. Why? Because I'm German. They had many exchanges with universities and their students were trained. So here is another nation which had occupied this area and they had adopted this religion and brought rabbis in and trained the people. But they were not Judean. Now let's jump to today in accordance to this history. 
The religion of the modern state of Israel is based on Kabbalistic and Talmudic traditions and is far removed from the biblical worship of Yahweh. And if it is based on the Talmud, it is so anti-Jesus Christ that it belies understanding. And here we have, in March 2006, while visiting Yeshiva University at Brooklyn, New York, a Jewish institute dedicated to the study of the what? Talmud. We have Cardinal Kasper. Who is Cardinal Kasper? Cardinal Kasper is the cardinal associated with ecumenism. They are honoring the Talmud together. You see, behind the scenes, there is a pact. Because I, as a Christian, can sympathize with every other religion, but I cannot embrace a religion that speaks evil of Jesus Christ. Nor can I have a union with such a religion. Because can two walk together lest they be agreed? Now let's get back to the Napoleonic society and see what happened further. Napoleon established both the Bank of France, we saw that, the French Bourse, the Stock Exchange, as well as the National Department of Tax Boards. Do we have all of those systems of governments in the world today, yes or no? Yes, we do. And we have the same system of economics today, yes or no? Yes. It's run, the world is run by the Stock Exchange. To ensure equitable taxation for all, consequently the income of the French peasants skyrocketed. Think tanks and research tenses were established in France to work on projects vital for national economy. So a tight, totally new economic order evolved. Who started these organizations? We will have to see. Who runs the secret societies today and the secret organizations? Who started them? Who is the instigator? Who's the boss behind the scenes? We will have to see. And maybe we'll get a different picture of what's happening in the world. An industrial board was organized to provide data and information to French industry as exemplified by the success of the sugar beet farming and the canning industry. In the military, Napoleon pioneered in what we describe today as the principles of war. And did you know that these principles, the armies of today are based on the organization created by Napoleon for his grand army and it has been used ever since. Who controls these armies? Who controls the war machines of the world? Who controls the gun running? These are important questions. And now it gets interesting. Napoleon disappears. He says, I want a Jewish state. I want to rebuild the Jewish temple. What is he planting in the mines? An idea. He starts the lodges. The British lodges start taking over these lodges eventually. Of course, they're all integrated. And then Prussia, when Napoleon is gone, retracted the liberal laws in 1815 after the Battle of Waterloo. The worst setback was inflicted upon the Jews of the Papal States. It would almost seem as if Pius VII had taken revenge on the Jewish population of his territory for the humiliation he had suffered at the hand of Napoleon. He was not content with their confinement behind the walls of the re-erected ghetto, but he obliged the Jews to wear the yellow badge. The Jews had to walk with a badge, with an armband. Does that ring a bell somewhere? In Sardina, the Jews were thrown back into ghettos and not allowed to build synagogues. Much later, some European nations assimilated the Jews between 1824 and 1867, Holland in 1830. These are Protestant nations. They don't understand what's going on. They're trying to help the Jews. Sweden, 1834. Switzerland, 1838. It is remarkable that in England, it was only in 1858, after Lord Lionel Rich, 
Rothschild was elected five times that he was permitted to take his seat in Parliament. It is also interesting to know that the laws that were passed in France in 1808 are still in existence even to this day. So there was liberty on the one hand, but oppression started to take over in Europe. And by the time we get to Adolf Hitler, did he introduce the same oppression, yes or no? Yes, he hounded them. He disenfranchised them. And the Russians, all of these nations, suddenly the world was in turmoil in war and the Jews were the hounded ones. And at the end of this war, where would those poor Jews go when they to tried to escape the turmoil of Europe? Where did they go? They were herded like sheep to a new Jewish state in order to create a new philosophy which was to be swallowed hook, line, and sinker by a world with a totally new religious philosophy, no longer based on Protestantism, but now based on new Catholic counter-theology. Have you ever thought about it? That the British, who were the saviors of Europe, allowed ships to be filled with Jewish hopefuls who wanted to emigrate to the West, how they wouldn't let those ships pass by, and how eventually they were all herded towards Palestine and the Jews had to settle in a land that had nothing? Well, it's interesting. You have to create a, a national identity. You have to create national heroes. And we dealt with that in previous lectures. I don't want to go into it. And eventually, where did they end up? They ended up the leaders of the nations. And a new nationality arose, and a new nationalistic, Zionistic pride arose, and a nation arose. I feel sorry for them. They have been hounded and herded. It is unbelievable. And this man was the lackey of his pope. And I'm not going to deal with that. And this man was maybe the same lackey sitting at the table behind the scenes. Revelation chapter 11, 9. And they of the people and the kindred and tongues and nations shall see the dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. The Bible was done away with. Secularism is going to rule the world for a time until the time is right and ripe to introduce a new theistic era. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and the earthquake was slain of men 7,000 and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. Will God stand by that the devil sets up a massive counterfeit system of religion and a counterfeit system that should herd people like cattle through Hegelian dialectic into a collective mindset without giving a counter? Of course he won't. They will sweep away God's word, but God's word will be lifted up. They will rise, and the Bible societies are formed, and God's word becomes prominent, although they suppressed it. 
And will he not have a remnant that will say, this is what the word says, to counter that which is being set up as a massive counterfeit on this planet? I believe he will. So as the enemy musters his forces for the final onslaught, so God raises the tabernacle of his truth and these two forces grow together until they will meet in the final conflict. But it is not a literal temple of stone that is involved, but a spiritual temple. God's people, based on the word, in conflict with the man of sin and his counterfeit. When Christ came the first time, he established his church, the spiritual temple, on the new cornerstone, and the wall of partition between Jew and Gentile was broken down. This new philosophy, this new religion, which literalizes the prophecies back to a literal Palestine, a literal Jewish state, are not based on the Bible. Amos 9.11, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. This is what we're talking about in this series. We have to repair the breach. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, says the Lord that doeth this. And the Apostle James applies this prophecy to the call of the Gentiles. So they will come into the church and they will raise up this tabernacle. Satan at the time of the end will set up a counterfeit to make it null and void. But God will raise up a remnant to stand against it. And we can read about it in Acts. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, Simeon has declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles and take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. And then he talks about these issues. And known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. God knows all these things. It's interesting that Wesley notes on Acts 15, verse 16, after this, the Jewish dispensation expires. So when God calls his church out of the Gentiles, a spiritual house, where the Jews can be grafted in if they accept the door, which is Jesus Christ, Wesley says, after the Jewish dispensation expires, I will build again the fallen tabernacle of David, by raising from his seed the Christ who shall build on the ruins of his fallen tabernacle a what? A spiritual and eternal kingdom. Hmm. So, but there was to be a second gathering after 1,260 years of prophesying in sackcloth. Remember at the end of this time period when the Gentiles had filled up the outer court after the 1,260 days where the Bible was prophesying in sackcloth because it was suppressed by papal supremacy, God would raise up a remnant and the word of God would once again be lifted up to heaven so that all kindreds, tongues, and nations should be able to make a choice. And in Isaiah's parallel prophecy to Daniel 11, 41 to 44, we read about this. Let's read it. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again. What does it say there? A second time. To recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Patros, from Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamat, and the islands of the sea. A universal gathering of God's people into a spiritual temple at the end of time. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. A universal gathering and an ensign. The law of God 
Christ our righteousness, the Sabbath as opposed to the papal Sabbath. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. There will be harmony in the final remnant of a remnant. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines towards the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hands upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Many will come out that were Abraham's seed. In other words, who have the mindset of Abraham. Verse 15 says, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with a mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria. Out of Babylon, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin. Like as it was in Israel today that he came out of the land of Egypt. There will be a second gathering. There will be a second move to a Canaan, which is heavenly. Isaiah 58 verse 12 tells what the nature of this movement will be. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations. There is no other foundation whereupon we can build except Christ Jesus. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. The restorer of the paths to dwell in. This message is to counterfeit is to counter the greatest counterfeit ever set up in human history. That which has been set up to dupe God's people and to lull them to sleep. If thou turn thy way away thy foot, foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to write upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. If you want eternal life, if you want the heritage of Jacob then come back into harmony with the only foundation that is of any value, Jesus Christ, and obey his commandments, including the Sabbath. This is the work of the remnant, and this is the work that will counter the lies of the evil one. Now, Louis F. Weir states, Jesus is now reigning. The prophecies concerning his kingdom of grace are now being fulfilled. This was the thrilling burden of the apostles preaching of the descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. It was this recognition of the fulfillment of the kingdom prophecies in relation to the church that gave power to their preaching and which also aroused the anger of the Jews against them. That which the Jews regarded as being holy future, listen carefully now, and to be fulfilled literally in connection with national Israel, the apostle preached as being fulfilled in the work and preaching of the gospel. They didn't want it. They wanted national deliverance. Today, Christendom has been led so far astray in its understanding of the prophecies that it takes the same view of those prophecies as did the Jews. Today, dispensationalist teaching is kingdom-based, literal, here on the earth. My kingdom is not of this world, says Jesus. Abraham was waiting for a heavenly city, not a literal city with a literal temple. He was waiting for one whose builder is God. The literal Palestinian fulfillment in relation to the Jews, they're all waiting for it. When the people of God, like the early disciples, seek God more earnestly in prayer and study and the Holy Spirit is poured out more fully upon them, they, like the disciples, will emphasize more the spiritual interpretation of those prophecies, which are so popularly applied literally in relation to Palestine. As such preaching angered the Jews, 
so such preaching today backed home by the power of the Holy Spirit will also create antagonism. We're heading for a conflict. This is going to be a war. Daniel 11 verse 40. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Does that make sense now? And the king of the north, gap in between, setting up the secular counterfeit system, running it into chaos and immorality, and then setting up the real one in its Hegelian principle. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, He'll have the military powers of the world behind him with horsemen, with many ships. That's the economy. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. There will be a remnant. A remnant with an Abraham mindset, by faith. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He will overrun that mindset. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver he will control the economy. The king of the north says the Bible will control the economy. So if we find out in these lectures that the king of the north controls the economy, is that speculation? Is that conspiracy? Or is that then just a fact? And over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his step. They will follow at his heel, literally. He runs the show. So the king of the south mindset is overwhelmed by a massive final thrust by the king of the north who employs fear tactics induced amidst the chaos of wars and economic chaos. The military alliances forged by the king of the north, north served to force the world to accept the collective morality, which will be dictated by himself. Even the very elect are at risk here. And the Bible says, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. This is a climax that is coming. And may the God of heaven help us. So the world will be stirred by the spirit of war. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. People are looking everywhere for the wrong things. They're looking to Palestine. They're looking for wars with Islam. They're looking for wars with that. When everything has been set up to get hold of your mind. I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in the utmost confusion. War, bloodshed, privation, want, famine, pestilence were abroad in the land. My attention was then called from the scene. There seemed to be a little time of peace. There seemed to be a little time of peace. Once more, the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me. And again, everything was in utmost confusion. Isn't this fascinating? All the wars that we had, the First World War, the Second World War, all the chaos that went together with that little piece of peace, and then again chaos. But now it's different. Strife, war, bloodshed, famine, pestilence, ranged where? Everywhere. 
we'd gone from a local to a universal. Other nations were engaged in this war and confusion, war caused famine, want and bloodshed caused pestilence and then men's heart failed them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. This is the final thing and this is going to come. There will be spiritual darkness. This is a time of spiritual darkness in the churches of the world. Ignorance of divine things has hidden God's and God and the truth from view. The forces of evil are gathering in strength. They're not getting weaker. There's not a war between religious bodies out there. It only appears so because it is religious bodies that con construe the religious mindset that has to take over from secularism. We'll talk about that in detail. Satan flatters his co-workers that he will do a work that will captivate the work. While partial inactivity has come upon the church, Satan and his hosts are intensely active. The professed Christian churches are not converting the world. They are themselves corrupted with selfishness and pride and need to feel the converting power of God in their midst before they can lead others to a purer and higher standard. In our day, as of old, the vital truths of God's word are set aside for human theories and speculations. Many professed ministers of the gospel do not accept the whole Bible as the inspired word. This is the, the bane of secularism. One, my, one my wise man rejects one portion, another questions, another part. They set up their judgments as superior to the word and the scripture which they teach rests upon their own authority. Its divine authenticity is destroyed. Thus the seeds of infidelity are sown broadcast for the people become confused and know not what to believe. There are many beliefs that the mind has no right to entertain. The world becomes confused. The devil knows what he's doing. He's hurting. He's hurting. He's playing a mind game. The world is spurred, stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth in board the inhabitants thereof. Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances. You know the wording. Broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore has the curse devoured the earth and they that dwell therein are desolate. The mirth of the tablet ceases, the noise of them that rejoice endeth, the joy of the harp ceases. Now, how are we going to get the new mindset? Let's look at some of the great thinkers of the Roman Catholic camp. George Weigel. 2008, he writes against the grain. Cutting against the grain of conventional wisdom, New York Times bestseller George Weigel offers a compelling look at the ways in which Catholic social teaching sheds light on the challenges of peace. George Weigel is advisor to Pope Benedict. The problem of pluralism, the quest for human rights and the defense of liberty in this major contribution of one of America's most prominent intellectuals offers a meticulous analysis of the foundation of the free society as he makes a powerful case for the role of moral reasoning in meeting the threats to human dignity posed by debonair nihilism, yihadist violence, and the brave new world of manufactured men and women. We need a new morality. Two recent books explain this, and they give a, a different focus. The one is called Parallel Empires. The other one is George Weigel's books, as they write about. This is Parallel Empires, and it's a fascinating and highly relevant history of the turbulent relationship between the United States and the Holy See, recounted and analyzed by Italian journalist and Vatican insider Massimo Franco. Parallel empire leaves no doubt regarding the impact that the struggle between these two great powers, one of secular might and the other of moral influence, has had on both our history and on today's world. Secularism 
is going to be conquered by the king of the north. Tidings out of the east, and the north shall trouble him. And then he will be in the glorious holy mountain. And remember that the NIV changes it to at or and. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom of yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. The beast, as we know, is Catholicism. The Bible is absolutely clear on that issue. Protestantism has said it, and the Bible says this power will succeed. So the king of the north, the papal system, controlling the collective religious mindsets will overrun secularism in all religious systems, which according to the Bible are all classified as Baal or Babylon. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords. And none shall help her, Revelation 17, 5. You know the prophecies. I'm not going to deal with them in detail. There are lectures available on DVDs on these issues. The waters, the nations, where the harlot sits, are the peoples, the multitudes, the nations, and the tongues. This church controls them. This is what the Bible teaches. The ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. Now, traditionally, the ten horns was Rome, a new constituted holy Roman Empire controlling the world through its secret echelons. Eventually, they will turn upon it when they find out that they have been duped and that they have been lied to. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his purpose to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. So they will give their power. They will give up their secularism. They will return the power to the beast power. And Rome will once again dictate morality to the world. And then God will intervene. And they will realize they have been duped. Balaam's prophecy. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I want to point out, Behold, I go unto my people, come therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people. When? In the latter days. These prophecies serve as a type, not only to what happened to literal Israel, but what happened or will happen to spiritual Israel. I shall see him, but not now. First, he proclaims the beautiful prophecies regarding Israel, and then he says what will happen to the nations at the end. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession, Seir also. And he goes throughout all the nations, out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. Christ will rule at the end. And Amalek will disappear. Amalek stands for the type of sin, that which will conquer you if you do not conquer it. That which will destroy you if you do not destroy it. And the Kenites, and the Kenites shall be wasted. And he goes through the coasts of Kittim. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place. And Balak also went his way. So before returning to his people, Balaam utters this most beautiful, sublime prophecy of the world's redeemer and the final destruction of the enemies of God. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. And he closed by predicting the complete destruction of Moab and Edom of Amalek, the Kenites, thus leaving to the Moabitish king no ray of hope. God is the final victor. But who's all going to die in this process if we don't mourn him? 
Then he returned to the land of Moab and laid his plans before the king. And what were the plans that he had? Let's lead the children of Israel into what? Into sin. And then we have them. Let's infiltrate. Let's infiltrate the children of Israel. Did they do it? Yes. So did they enter in to Israel's camp or was it something that happened outside Israel's camp? Inside. Is the same going to happen at the end of time? Is the king of the north going to plant his tent in God's church? Yes, he will. But he didn't win then and so he won't win now either. Because type will meet anti-type. So the Moabites themselves were convinced that so long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. The plan proposed by Balaam was to separate them from God by enticing them into idolatry. If they could be led to engage in the licentious worship of Baal and Asherah, the omnipotent protector would become their enemy. Do you think that at the time of the end for which these prophecies serve as a type, as we just read in the Bible, the king of the north, Rome, will plant its collective mindset within the very boundaries of God's church? Do you think he'll do it? I'm afraid he will. I think the King James is correct. It will be in. Afterwards he brought me to the gate, even to the gate that looks to, to the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. So the message, Christ is coming, will have frightened the king of the north. The three angels' message as proclaimed in the world will put the fear of God into him. And the coming of Christ is also the king of the north, the real king of the north who is coming. So fear for the kings that come from the east and fear for the true king of the north. The message proclaimed by God's people at the end of time will rile him up. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the vision were like the vision that I saw by the river Kiba, and I fell upon my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by way of the gate, which prospect is towards the east. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, Ezekiel 1 verse 4, a great cloud and fire unfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the colors of amber, of the midst of fire, Christ himself, the king of the north, the true king of the north, comes from the east and obliterates the king of the north, the counterfeit one, by the brightness of his coming. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, Psalms 48, verse 2. The true kingdom of the north is God's kingdom. Sit in the dust, O daughter of Babylon. Sit in the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. And thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever. She's a church. She's a church that has in Juice the mindset which is contrary to the gospel. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures and dwelleth carefully, carelessly, that says in their heart, I am, she's another God, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I see loss of children. But these two things shall come on you in the same day, and you will be destroyed. You will be a widow, and you will suffer loss of children. Stand now with thy enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries, thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now your astrologers and your stargazers and your monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee. So all of these mindsets, spiritualism, all of these counterfeit Babylonian religious systems will come to an end because they all constitute the mindset of the king of the north. All right, think about this. Where does Islam fit in then? 
Is it king of the south or is it now king of the north? It must be king of the north because it has a religious collective mindset and it's under control of the papacy. How? Three secret societies. We'll see that in the next lectures. Now note further. Thus shall they be unto thee with whom thou hast labored even thy merchants from thy youth that shall wander every one to his court and none shall save thee. Who controls the economy? It's Babylon. And in the next lecture we will see that when this great conflict for the mind comes to a close, Christ returns, the king of the north, the true king, and obliterates the mindset of the false king of the north. May the Lord help us, because we are heading for troubleth times. Amen.